All right, we are going to be starting our second set of notes on the Nidarians. We are in the same domain. Make sure you get this information down. Extremely important, the domain Eukarya. The kingdom that we're in is the kingdom Animalia. The phylum Nidaria, C-N-I-D-A-R-I-A. -I -I -A. Now, last time we talked about those particular characteristics that all of the organisms have within this phylum Nidaria. And then we started breaking it down a little bit because all of the organisms in the phylum Nidaria are not the same. There are some differences. Since we're looking at those similarities and differences, the relationships between these organisms, we started getting into the classes. The first class we looked at last time was the class Hydrozoa. Well, today we're going to look at the class Scyphozoa, Anthozoa, and the class Cubozoa. Scyphozoa is spelled S C Y. P-H-O-Z-O-A, Anthozoa, A-N-T-H-O-Z-O-A, and the Cubozoa, C-U-B-O-Z-O-A. We also are going to look at another group of organisms that are very, very similar to the Nigerians, and that's the phylum Tenophora, C-T-E-N-O-P. H-O-R-A, phylum tenophora. Very similar, but again, some distinctive differences that these organisms have that allow them to be grouped in a different phylum than these cnidarians. So the first little bit, uh, we're going to be talking about the scyphozoa. These are known as the jellies. Used to be called jellyfish, but ladies and gentlemen, these are not fish. Fish have very specific characteristics. Example, a backbone, every single fish. These guys don't have those. So these are not jellyfish. Go to Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a huge wing called the Hall of the Jellies. Not jellyfish, the jellies. So be very, very careful about those words that you choose to use uh, when you are filling out information on, say, an essential skill or the short answer lab practical final. So our class Scyphozoa here, these are known as the jellies. The dominant form that these particular organisms have is the medusa. That is the bell-shaped form that we talked about last time. And this bell-shaped form pulsates and swims. And that's how these particular organisms are moving. So when we're talking about that movement, these guys can swim. And it's that pulsating motion of the bell. To control that pulsating motion of the bell, they have to have that nerve net of a bundle of nerves uh, right around this edge here, just a few more than maybe throughout the rest of the bell. Their cnidocytes are located in the tentacles. You can see in this middle picture here, these tentacles coming down uh, from that uh, bell-shaped organism. You can see it over here in this particular picture here, and uh, in this one on the side, just a few different examples of these organisms in the class Scyphozoa. This is where the cnidocytes are. This is the danger area. So in the movie Finding Nemo, they actually were very scientifically accurate. Marlin, Nemo's father, and Dory were bouncing on the tops of these jellies. They can do that. There are no nidocytes there that could eject the nematocysts into their particular cells. And so they aren't going to be stung. Now, here's someone who was stung. This is actually a wrist in the back of the hand right here, you can see the uh, redness of these areas and these welts right here. Because remember, when they're stung by the nidocyte cells on these tentacles, those nidocyte cells are ejecting that harpoon-like nematocyst into our skin, our cells. Sometimes there's some poison in those particular nematocysts, but no matter if there is or isn't, we're still having little teeny tiny, very small smaller than cells, microscopic, uh, organelles being injected into our skin. That's going to damage our cells, and hence we have the uh, redness right here. Uh, a little bit about these particular organisms. They do have all of those characteristics, those main characteristics uh, of the organisms in the cnidaria, but there's a couple unique things that uh, these guys have, and one of those unique things uh, that you should be aware of about the jellies is their life cycle, how these guys actually uh, live. We're going to look at uh, one uh, particular one. It's called Aurelia. And Aurelia is a, um, uh, the scientific name 
<coughs> excuse me, it's the common moon jelly. And these are actually very, very common organisms. Um, these guys include both a medusa and a polyp form in their life cycle. So there's some time that they're spent swimming around as that bell shape and sometimes spent as the vase shape as that polyp. Their adult life is spent here as the medusa. And that's very important. The medusa is the form where sexual reproduction occurs. So this medusa, and you can see it over here, there's their life cycle. This medusa is going to produce egg, but it's going to produce sperms, the gametes. And when this medusa produces eggs and sperm, when it's sexually mature, <coughs> the medusa is going to release the eggs or sperm out into the water where they're swimming. The eggs and sperm, hopefully, will meet up with another egg or sperm, depending. And when that happens, the egg is fertilized, and it becomes the ciliated larva form that we talked about last time called the planula larva. Very important to remember that planula larva. The planula larva is going to swim around. It's going to find some place that it can attach to. When it does so, it's going to transform into a polyp. That sessile form has the uh, tentacles sticking up there with those cnidocytes. The polyp's going to grow, perhaps, it can go through asexual reproduction if it's doing very well, where it can bud off a new polyp growing next to it. So now we have two or three or four more genetically identical individuals doing very well growing. As these polyps mature, the polyps are going to start budding off very small baby, if you will, medusa. From the top portion here, where these tentacles are, a medusa will develop and come off. It looks like a mini version of the adults. They'll swim around. It's kind of little flexible bell shapes. They're not very smooth. They're kind of jerky. But they'll swim around. And they will feed and they'll grow and mature into the adult moon jelly. This is how most all of the scyphozoans go through reproduction. These stacks of... Uh, of polyps producing medusa, which develop into the sexually mature adults, which produce the eggs, and those eggs get, are fertilized by the sperm, and we get the planula larva, which attach and develop back into the polyp, and it continues around in this very complex life cycle for such a simple organism. This reproduction process is very unique. Yes, remember that it's unique, but I'm also going to ask that you remember this particular process. Be because it's so unique, it is important to understand how our different organisms are reproducing. The next class here is the class Anthozoa. This particular name means flower animals. The organisms that um, are in this particular class, their dominant form is the polyp. Most of them have very little or no part of their life spent as a medusa, swimming around. So we have uh, organisms like these guys, anemones, and we've got uh, corals. Here's an anemone down here. Here's corals over here. So a couple of different pictures showing uh, these particular um, different types uh, or examples of organisms in the class Anthozoa. One thing to understand about corals is that corals are colonial polyps. Many of these individual polyps attach together, forming these very, very large, in some cases, organisms. Uh, the cnidocytes of these guys are all located. It's hard to see in this picture here right on the edge. Uh, the tentacles here, very fine tentacles over here, and even in the corals, those polyps coming out of their coral uh, skeleton, which I'll talk about here in just a moment, those tentacles have cnidocytes on there. But corals typically don't use their cnidocytes for feeding like some of these anemones do. One of the unique things about the class Anthozoa, they are sessile, they are attached. However, they can move around. And in this picture here, this is a picture of uh, someone's um, tank at their house. And the anemone is actually crawling up the wall of the tank. You can see this white coloring right here. This is the bottom of the anemone, something you don't normally see because it's usually attached onto the substrate, onto a rock or other hard surface uh, like these guys are. But it's actually muscular. It's called, it's called uh, a pedal disc. And the uh, pedal, or sometimes basal, 
P A S A L, and pedal uh, is P E D A L, almost like pedal, but pronounced pedal disc. Uh, it, it, it's able to be moved. There's muscular contractions, again, similar to how the bell of the Medusa contracts. The bottom can actually contract as well, and it can scoop these guys along the surface. Several years ago, I had a sea anemone in my tank up here at the front of the room. Put it in there and attached onto one of the rocks. It was there for a few days and didn't like where it was. Didn't like the flow of the water around it. Didn't feel like it was going to get enough nutrients, whatever it might be. And so it started moving around in search of a better place for it to live. Moving to the back side of the rocks and it started going up the back side of the aquarium until for whatever reason it got right up against one of the filters in the back. A lot of water flow there is the only thing I could think of. It was there for a few days and pretty soon it got into the filter. Well, inside these filters, there's little uh, magnets that have fans attached to them that are spinning around, and that's how the water flows. So you can imagine what happens when the sea anemone gets caught in the fan. I don't want to talk about it anymore. With these particular organisms, with their nitocytes, um, they actually, uh, I talked about the movement, but they actually uh, use those uh, nitocytes in those tentacles for feeding. So they're capturing food and bringing it into the mouth. I'll show you some pictures of that in our last set of notes, uh, but they also use them for defense. These guys are, are able to move around as they, they can lean over if another sea anemone gets too close to them, they can actually sting the other sea anemone, and when they're stinging that other sea anemone, it's a slow motion battle. I'll show you a video of that uh, in class so we can talk about it a little bit next time. Pretty cool to watch these guys defend the area around them. They do that so that they can get uh, as much food as they're going to to need. Uh, our final class of the four in the uh, phylum Cnidaria is the class Cubozoa. Cubozoa. I don't want you to know a lot about these. Uh, they're very similar to the uh, Scyphozoa. There's about 50 or so species of these organisms and they're called commonly uh, by the name of the box jellies. These are the box jellies, pretty elaborate. But one of the things with the uh, box, je box jellies, or sometimes you'll hear sea wasp, um, these guys have really long, thin tentacles. Their tentacles can uh, 10 feet. We're talking about organisms that uh, their main body is probably about an inch. So main body an inch, tentacles about 10 feet, uh, extremely long tentacles. Uh, and they are very, very, very poisonous organisms. Um, here's a person who, uh, got wrapped in the tentacles, uh, here's their legs. Uh, you can see all the red welts uh, all over the knees, calves, a little bit up here on the, the thigh. Um, some of you, maybe in forensics, might recognize this is a, an autopsy table. So this is someone who died uh, from being stung by the box jellies. That's one of the reasons why I want you to uh, be aware of them is that these guys live primarily in really warm water uh, along the coast, you know, like off uh, the coast of Australia. Uh, the Philippines, Southeast Asia, um, Hawaii, Gulf Coast of the United States, Florida. You know, places where we like to go swimming in the warm water. So they are very, very, very deadly for people because we interact with them uh, a little bit more often. The largest of these is the uh, Australian box jelly, and it's actually considered to be um, one of the top three most venomous marine animals. Um, its sting, as we can see here, oftentimes is uh, fatal. So those are the uh, four classes, Hydrozoa, Scyphozoa, Amphozoa, and Cubozoa in the phylum Cnidaria. So now I'd like to talk about one more phylum really quickly, and that one more phylum is related to these organisms. That's why we're going to be talking about here, but I want to illustrate particularly the differences. And the name of the phylum is Tenophora, C-T-E-N-O-P-H-O-R-A. And the picture here, when you look at these, one of the first thoughts for a lot of people is that it looks just like jellies, and you're right. It does look very much like jellies. It has the Medusa form. It looks so much like jellies that one of the common names for the Tenophora actually is the comb jellies. And one of the unique things about these guys, and the reason they're called combs, and you can kind of see it, over here, it looks like there's these little light colored uh, pieces sticking out here. It looks like there's combs that are sticking out of the body. Um, the name actually means comb holder. Uh, that's where we get this tenophora from. Uh, but they have, all of them, 
eight very distinctive rows of cilia. That's where all these little lines are, is actually cilia. And, and the interesting thing about these guys is that they swim not by pulsing. They swim by moving the cilia, these eight rows, back and forth. This picture here, you can see the rows pretty well. There's one over here, there's one here, 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 there's one on this side. There's actually two more in the back. You can kind of see one of the ridges over here. These are the largest organisms that can swim or move around using cilia. I mean, these guys can be a few inches long. And so we can actually see all the little cilia moving. So when you look at one here, there's actually hundreds of cilia right there. So they're the largest organisms that actually swim uh, in this particular way. So make sure you have written down that these are the comb jellies. Comb jellies because of all the little cilia sticking out right there. Uh, their unique characteristics, I just kind of listed them basically here. I talked about the eight rows of cilia. But one of the other unique things is that they do not have nidocyte cells. So no stinging cells. If they did, they would be in the cnidaria phylum. But they don't. They have instead something called a coloblast cell. C-O-L-L-O. B-L-A-S-T. Coloblast cells are similar. They're in their tentacles, these guys hanging down here, and they only have a couple of very small tentacles. But these particular coloblast cells don't sting. Instead, they produce a sticky substance. And so these guys will move around in search of prey. And when they come across prey, they'll move up to it, and then their tentacles just kind of stick to it. By sticking to it, the tentacles are able to then move their prey items into the mouth, which is here underneath, just like in the medusa of those Skyphozoa. Now, one of the other important things is if these guys are swimming around in search of prey, they have to be able to control their body a little bit better. So they have a different type of nervous system, still with a nerve net around the body, but they have an organ located at the very top up here, very top up here, and this particular organ is called the apical organ, and it is the very, very beginnings of a central nervous system. It's a bundle of nerve cells, and its main purpose is to control the cilia. Therefore, it controls where these organisms move. It can orient them in the ocean. They can be moving up, they can choose to swim to the sides, or down, at angles, moving around. Jellies, the Skyphozoa cannot do that talked about last set of notes in our last lecture that they have a nerve net. They don't have any way of controlling where they're going. They just pulse. If this pulsing happens to be going down to the bottom, then it's going down to the bottom. It's going up, it's going up. It's going to the sides, it's going to the sides. But these guys, why I think they're so cool is that they're the simplest organs that can start to control exactly where they are heading. So that's very, very, very important. Put some asterisks next to it. Hint, hint, hint. The apical organ, very beginning of a central nervous system, is able to control the cilia and therefore coordinate the movement of these particular organisms. And then lastly, I put this here, this bioluminescence. These guys can actually glow. And there's a reason for that, because we find them often at depth, that is deep down past where that light is. So these particular organisms glow to attract organisms that they might be able to eat to them. So when you look at a picture here and you see that, oh yeah, they are glowing, it's not just the picture, it's not the flash, it's the actual organisms. They do emit this glow and it's just a couple different kinds of proteins that their cells create. And when these proteins come in contact with each other, they're able to glow. So that bioluminescence helps them to attract prey to uh, each uh, of the individual ten offerings. And that is uh, the end of the Cnidarians. We have part one and part two. A little bit on those ten offerings there at the end. Uh, an organism that's very similar, but has a few distinct differences that you need to make sure you get uh, dialed in for the test. Thanks very much, and uh, we'll see as we wrap up this unit uh, coming up over the next couple of days.